Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Um, welcome to this panel. My name is Ola Veltijs. I will be chairing this panel, and I want to give a very special and warm welcome to our four panelists, who I will introduce in a minute, and who were so brave to accept the invitation for this panel titled The End of Neoliberalism? Question uh, mark. I guess some people will still be coming in. Uh, the presidential address has just now ended, but I would say let's give it a start anyway. And so this panel basically will be about this question, what the impact of the pandemic has been on uh, neoliberalism. I mean, the end of neoliberalism has been proclaimed that numerous times since the beginning of the pandemic, and often not by exactly left-leaning media, such as the Financial Times or The Economist. We have heard right-wing pundit states that we should embrace socialism and investment bank strategists have concluded that there is no such thing as a free market anymore. Governments indeed have provided all kinds of wage support to workers and financial support to companies in a wide range of industries in order to keep them afloat. The scale of it would have been hard to imagine just two years ago. As a result, We've also seen an almost unprecedented increase in public spending. Deficits have soared, and so has government debt. According to some, the rapid closing of borders, which happened right after the beginning of the pandemic, and the realization that dependence on other countries for, for instance, face masks or ventilators is far from ideal, that would usher us into an era of de-globalization and de-legitimization -leg of free trade. Many governments seem to realize that the public sector, and in particular healthcare, are in a desperate state and are not able to face crisis after at least two decades of neoliberal policies and budget cuts of public services. Just two days ago, 130 nations lent support to the idea of a global minimum corporate tax of 15% in order to end the race to the bottom. So, it is not difficult to see why so many people have proclaimed neoliberalism debt and have been using the metaphor of a great reset, marking a new era of big government. But of course, this is not the first time that neoliberalism has been pronounced debt. It happened so many times before. And when that happened, for instance, after the financial crisis of 2008, in many elections right afterwards, left-wing governments were defeated nevertheless. Time and again, neoliberalism turns out to be strikingly resilient. So is this time going to be different? And does the fact that the state is back, or maybe it has never been absent, does that really mean that neoliberalism as an era is coming to an end? These are, of course, daunting questions to think about. Daunting not only because we know from history that academics has, have so often miserably failed to make good predictions about such matters, but also daunting because of their complexity and because of their multi-layered character, which of course, and they have of course been addressed in many sessions in this entire SASI conference. These questions touch upon so many different topics and policy domains, and they play out so differently in various parts of the world. And moreover, they hinge so crucially on different understandings of what neoliberalism is to begin with. Nevertheless, I think we could not have wished for a better lineup of panelists to discuss these issues today and hopefully get at least some clarity. The panelists have given it a lot of thought already and have published about it over the last year. And moreover, the panelists are widely acclaimed scholars in the rise of neoliberalism. And so they may be able to draw conclusions about its potential demise on that basis. Without further ado, it is a great honor to introduce today's panelists to you. And for the sake of time, I will only introduce them briefly, which means that I will in no way be able to do justice to their track records and accomplishments. 
In this session, we will first be listening to Quinn Slobodian, who had a fire alarm in his building just now, but he went out uh, and he is um, an associate professor at the his uh, in, of history at Wellesley College. He has specialized in modern German and international history with a focus on politics, movement, the intellectual history of neoliberalism. And why the plain book is globalists, the end of empire and the birth of neoliberalism. And I am sure many of you have been reading, uh, have read that uh, book. Next, we will have Saori Shibata, who is a university lecturer at Leiden University at the Institute of Area Studies, specializing in the economy of modern Japan. Her most recent book at Cornell University Press is Contesting Precarity in Japan, the Rise of Non-Regular Workers and the New Policy Dissensus. Then we will have Alfredo Saad Filio, who is Professor of Political Economy and International Development in the Department of International Development at King's College in London, where he currently also serves as the head of department. He has written widely on neoliberalism, including a recent highly critical commentary, which was published in Critical Sociology on COVID-19 and the end of neoliberalism. Then finally, we will listen to Marion Fourcade, who is professor of sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. She has written on a wide range of topics, including the rise of neoliberalism, the profession of economics, and more recently on digital society and digital economy. She has co-edited a book which will come out later this year at the University of Chicago Press called Pandemic Exposures, Economy and Society in the Time of Coronavirus. And she's also a past president of SASI. The format of the session is as follows. Um, uh, we will have each of the four panelists speaking for about 10 minutes. I will invite the panelists to respond to each other afterwards. And after that, I will open it up to the audience. As you noticed, we have chosen for the format of a regular Zoom session today because it is more interactive and dynamic than a webinar and um, uh, where there is no audience. And usually it feels like you're speaking into this digital void. But of course, this regular Zoom session is also slightly more chaotic potentially because of microphones that keep left on. Um, so it does require a bit more discipline on the side of all of us. So I would like to ask you to keep your camera on if you can, but your microphone off. If you want to ask a question, please raise your digital hand. Feel free to use the chat function to chat among yourselves, but for us as panelists and for me as moderator, it might be hard to read all of the chats. So again, if you want to ask a question, use your digital hand. And once I give you the floor, switch on your microphone. I would also like you uh, to ask you, I would like to ask you to keep your questions short and clear. And please do not provide a mini lecture of your own, however interesting it may be, because we only have 90 minutes of time. So mini lectures might be difficult for that. And in, in the ultimate case, I will need to have the drastic measure of muting you um, uh, if, uh, if you don't keep it short. That is the introduction from, from my side. Um, now the floor is to Quinn Slobodian. Uh, Quinn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks everybody for um, popping in here on Sunday, 4th of July. I had a fire alarm five minutes before this was to start in my office, which is why I'm <laughs> lovely surroundings and the internet is less than full bars so you'll have to forgive me if it goes in and out I can't say anything about it all right so I'm gonna do I guess a little bit of like a ground clearing and I hope it's not too rudimentary but I think it can be helpful when one starts any of these sort of neoliberalism conversations to clarify the terms and in that sense I want to sort of quickly introduce what I see as the, the four ways that people tend to use the category of neoliberalism. Um, the first I think is when people talk about neoliberalism as a kind of a period in world history. By this definition, sort of sometime in the 1970s, the world entered something called the neoliberal era um, as Ronald Reagan and Thatcher came to power 
pushed market reforms domestically, which were then rolled out through the global south to the global south via the IMF and the World Bank and structural adjustment programs. The collapse of the Soviet Union left, as we are told, only one model of political economy left standing. So that's neoliberalism as epoch or as era. A second way I think it's used is as a kind of a policy package, right? That accompanied this epoch in world history. So the familiar uh, package of the Washington Consensus, liberalize, privatize, deregulate, push free trade over protection, private ownership over public ownership, flexible over unionized labor markets, personal responsibility over the social state and so on. So neoliberalism as policy package. A third definition I think sees neoliberalism as a kind of intellectual movement, um, which earned its name when neoliberalism was coined and adopted first in 1938 by a group of intellectuals, journalists, policymakers gathered in the Montpellerin Society since 1947 in a group that includes famous Nobel Prize winning economists like Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, Ronald Coase, Ludwig von Mises, and many others. They got together to discuss what they saw as the kind of unfolding and ever mutating threats that were posed to the stability of the global capitalism that they held dear. So that's neoliberalism as intellectual movement, the kind of stuff that I have mostly done myself. A final approach to neoliberalism or deployment of neoliberalism, and I would say this is more common in kind of journalism than it is in scholarship. I fear that I've frozen here. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I will go on, make sure I'm not just speaking into the void. Olaf, can you give me a high sign or write something no. in the chat if I'm still transmitting here? You're doing perfectly well, Quinn. Great, okay, so it's the problems only on my side. Um, so I think the fourth way that neoliberalism is used is to describe a kind of a worldview, right? And so by this definition, neoliberal self-understanding encourages us to perceive ourselves and others as bundles of assets to be accumulated, leveraged and capitalized on and so on. By this definition, economics becomes the only meaningful measure of human life and every last thing on the planet is deemed available to be bought and sold. So that's neoliberalism as kind of worldview. And I would say, especially in the kind of progressive journalistic world and the activist world, that's often the way one encounters neoliberalism in this sort of most maximalist or hyperbolic form. So I think that the central problem of the scholarship on neoliberalism or how one can answer any of these questions is the way that those four definitions are often kind of mixed and matched and combined and collapsed into one another in ways that can lead often to greater confusion than clarity. So let's take our question for today. Is the neoliberal era over? I mean, such a question I think implies a kind of a uniformity of global political economy that actually never existed, right? I mean, it, it suggests that there's been kind of one model of political economy, let's take after the fall of the Soviet Union, which discounts, of course, not only the mixed economies of European social democracy, the pink tide post neoliberal moment in Latin America, or the smaller sort of remnant communist states like Cuba, but also of course the one big exception, which is impossible not to talk about, is the People's Republic of China, which though not really communist by any plausible measure is not really neoliberal by any, I think, working definition either. Um, uses a very different language of legitimacy, a different treatment of the public-private divide, the role of state and so on. And this is the kind of thing that Isabella Weber has written so well about. So I think the more one looks at the conduct of governments, the growth of state budgets, the continued existence of social services, even in the face of attempts to dismantle them and so on, you know, the more one is tempted to agree with Keen Birch, the sociologist, that when it comes to actual existing state policy, in a way, we have never been neoliberal. So pronouncing the kind of birth and death of eras or epochs as these sort of um, internally consistent or homogeneous spans of time can always you know produce sort of more problems than it produces i think solutions or clarity and it's sort of it's more the domain of op-eds and think pieces than in a way the domain of serious scholarship so if that's true what would it mean to say that neoliberalism was over right i mean if we follow the second definition and we look at neoliberalism as a kind of a policy package then we can talk about what has and hasn't changed since right 2020, 2016, 2008. And here I think, you know, 
we need to not just talk about COVID, but we really need to talk about the after effects or the learn lessons learned from the global financial crisis in 2008. Not because the financial sector was re-regulated, because of course it wasn't, but because of a paradigm shift in the treatment of money. The Federal Reserve Bank, as we now all know through the wonderful histories of people like Adam Tooze, um, flooded the world market with liquidity, open swap lines to save global credit markets. And in the years that followed, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England followed suit. Um, they discovered this kind of, this is a kind of epochal discovery that they could do so without producing sort of immediate inflation. And in fact, um, the opposite problem is sort of presenting itself, right? The fear of over the last 10 years, 11 years, the problem of deflation, the problem of zero interest rates. So now in 2021, as governments seek to build back better in the jargon of the moment after COVID, this has opened up, right? This, this change in attitude towards money has opened up the possibility of a departure from the austerity policies that were really internalized for politicians for a generation. Um, I think the multi-trillion dollar spending plans announced by the Biden administration, filled with the commitments for infrastructure, childcare, climate mitigation, and so on, do suggest a kind of a renewed flexibility in policy circles about using the power of state and state spending for a broader range of ends. However, whether such ambitious policies will actually translate into reality is another question again, right? I think, you know, this third definition of neoliberalism as an intellectual movement also points not just to a few famous economists, but also the so-called think tank archipelago of lobbyists and pressure groups from the Heritage Foundation and ALEC in the US, Institute of Economic Affairs in the UK, alongside hundreds more globally, that have had, of course, considerable success in capturing policy agendas in the last few decades through their corporate backers. Legislative bodies and courts in the United States are still filled with people, I think, dedicated to blocking the rollout of this post-neoliberal Bidenite, Bidenomic economic policy. They uh, continue to see the question of um, more equitable outcomes as secondary to the protection of private rights and capital rights. So in this case, right, even if neoliberalism is suffering a kind of a defeat at the peak of the policy pyramid, and I think it has a, a kind of a seizure of the commanding heights of the policy paradigm with the, the sort of the storming of the capital by various progressive economists and think tankers from Heather Boucher to Sabil Rahman to Lena Khan. Even if they can seize the top, that doesn't mean that they can actually roll out their policy agenda below the peak, right? We don't live in a monarchy in the United States. You need to pass things through Congress. And I think it would be unwise to dismiss how broad the base of lawmakers is, who still believe, as Ludwig von Mises put it a thousand or a hundred years ago, that, quote, our whole civilization rests on the fact that men have always succeeded in beating off the attack of the redistributors. So this fear of socialism, this ramped up fear of communism, the radical left, you know, this is still a serious fear for a good half of the electorate and um, the people who they elect. So I think this leaves us with the final definition, right? And this is where I'll finish. If the final definition is of neoliberalism as a kind of a worldview, then if you look more closely, this doesn't look that much different than what Marx and Engels wrote about in 1848 when they said that bourgeois society, quote, left remaining no other bond between man and man than naked self-interest and callous cash payment. This was, of course, dubbed capitalism later in the 19th century. And I think actually this category remains pretty adequate to describe a world where distribution is primarily determined by private rather than public actors. And the, and the, and, uh, the further we go from the commanding heights of po the policy paradigm, era, the less it seems like this way of organizing human affairs is actually faltering, right? I mean, the K-shaped recovery from the pandemic compounded the K-shaped one that followed the global financial crisis. Families with assets saw their wealth boom, and those without saw their wages stagnate along with their life's chances. Talk to someone working three jobs in the service sector in the United States today and tell them that neoliberalism is over, I think they'll be quite surprised to hear it. So I think to be realistic, one should see that even if the neoliberal model as this particular package of policy ideas is exhausted and happens to perish this time, after all of the times it did not perish, then we have to just then begin to talk about how capitalism itself will live on in a different guise. And as the rain begins to fall here on me, I think I'll leave it there and pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you for, for this, uh, Quinn, 
before before you switch your camera off, well, you already did, and before we can turn to Saori, I was just wondering if you could talk one more minute about how this plays out on the global level. Um, I mean, this is what you your work has uh, been very much about. Um, so especially when you think about it in the institutional embedding in global economic institutions, how how does this yeah, proclaimed end of neoliberalism play out there? Starting to rain very heavily here, so I need to find cover. I'm sorry. I'll be I'll be back as soon as I can. Okay, so better to uh, move on to Saori right away, I would say. Yes. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. So made a slide so that my face don't go big on the screen. Um, so it's a bit pressure to follow uh, Quinn's interesting uh, talk. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, so I'll, my talk might go a tiny bit over 10 minutes, uh, but I'll time myself. So, so the, uh, the key points I want to highlight today are that uh, we are not maybe seeing the end of neoliberalism, but instead we have started seeing, um, witnessing an ongoing process of digitalization, which is further uh, consolidating authoritarian neoliberalism reinforcing the power of capital and further creating flexibility and precarity. So each of these trends face ongoing contestation. So this is the kind of key points of my talk today. Uh, as many commentators have highlighted already, we have seen uh, how fragile and contradictory neoliberalism is in the time of the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, many advanced economies tend to kind of temporarily temporarily Keynesian measures. Um, I think Alfredo is going to probably talk about these. I borrowed his uh, research um, terms, like uh, these uh, temporarily Keynesian measures are referred to emergency Keynesianism or neoliberal disaster socialism uh, by temporarily adopting Keynesian uh, style policies. Many uh, states are trying to save the market, uh, its social order, neoliberalism itself, and uh, accumulation. Otherwise, capital and the state uh, will struggle to govern working class in the time of the crisis. And um, as part of these trends, we should also, I think, consider the process of digitalization. Uh, this digitalization is authoritarian in nature, in my opinion, acting to increase surveillance and control in the workplace, as well as in the uh, private domain as well. Uh, reinforcing the precarity of workers, intensifying work, and reducing autonomy. Uh, these characteristics have emerged under neoliberalism, but have been furthered by the onset of digitalization. So these characteristics echo the characteristics of authoritarian neoliberalism, in which political and business elites attempt to consolidate their power and authority over people and workers. Um, authoritarianism has increasingly become the means through which politicians and business elites seek to stabilize and secure contemporary neoliberal capitalism. Uh, COVID-19 has already uh, has advanced the already existing process of automation in various sectors across the global economy. Uh, many jobs can be done remotely and machines and robots are pandemic proof. Uh, therefore, the current pandemic is likely to encourage employers further to replace jobs with automation. According to McKinsey's report, uh, lockdown has already had a disproportionate impact on lower-waged workers, and the impact of automation is also likely to lead to further economic insecurity for many workers. So digitalization can be considered to be complementary to authoritarian neoliberalism and acting to reinforce neoliberalism or neoliberalization. Um, many governments are keen on supporting the advance and integration of new technologies in the market by formulating policies uh, which seek to enhance digitalization in many parts of the economy. Uh, it is undeniable that there are many benefits and advantages in technologies, including uh, agility, efficiency, reducing the burden of workers, improved productivity, they can be a solution for the aging society and labor shortage. However, uh, I 
uh, raise uh, a number of important concerns associated with digitalization. One of them is that digitalization enables capital to exert increased power over workers as a result of de-skilling, uh, de-skilling workers, precarizing workers and intensifying competition. The association between technology and de-skilling is not a recent phenomenon. This connection had all already become evident uh, under Fordism, which sought to eliminate all unnecessary emotions from the mass production line. Automation in the digital era continues or further accelerates this attempt to break up the tasks into less complicated and fragmented components. For instance, the gig economy creates fragmented tasks, tasks online. Uh, one of the consequences of uh, this fragmentation is that gig workers do not recognize the larger work process of which they only perform a small fragmented part. Algorithms make calculation based on existing data, finding correlations and patterns and developing new forms of empirical knowledge. Uh, the, these algorithms in turn create the capacity to further uh, intensify work while de-skilling workers. Human workers have to conduct fragmented tasks, including checking data, clarifying data, filtering data, testing the algorithms and overseeing the process of machine learning. This work has become increasingly mundane and, and, and appealing. Automation forces humans to compete with machines and this involves a downward pressure on low skilled jobs. Digitalization uh, entails authoritarian characteristics, including uh, the intensification of work and precarization of workers. Authoritarian digital capitalism therefore acts to further the power of uh, control of capital over workers. Um, another feature of digitalization is its capacity to reduce workers' autonomy. Uh, this echoes the broader characteristics of authoritarian neoliberalism. Uh, new technologies have the potential to curtail workers' autonomy due to the way that they prioritize certain data and metrics and information. This has the effect of making certain types of behavior more visible and valued than others, leading to an increase in the importance of certain phenomena whilst others are uh, rendered marginal. This uh, kind of resonate with what uh, Shoshana Zuboff calls informating. Uh, technology not only produces, uh, aut uh, not only automates pr uh, production, but also creates new information that did not exist before, including data, videos, uh, metrics, digital numbers, all of which can be used for tracking and analysis. This informating capacity um, enables managers and employers to acquire new information that contributes to both production processes and monitor workers. This uh, leads to another aspect of technology, namely increased surveillance. New technologies can increase surveillance uh, of workers, which consequently result in a decline in workers' autonomy. Uh, for instance, electronic monitoring devices have been introduced in a number of service sectors, including like restaurants or care service sector. Uh, in the care service sector, for instance, wearable devices have made real-time data visible to employers and are used to track missed, late and overrunning visits. This allows workers to be punished or uh, uncompensated as their performance measured by metrics. Uh, big data benefits employers in part by creating intense monitoring of human labor. Uh, firms such as Google have begun to use big data to manage their employees at work. This strategy is termed people analytics, a term originally used to analyze customers and clients and select good employees, as well as collecting social data on employees to facilitate good teamwork. So people analytics can therefore enable a new uh, stage in workplace rationalization or optimization in which metrics uh, continuously govern employees' behavior in the workplace. So this is my final slide. Uh, if we understand the primary purpose of neoliberalism to be the creation of flexible, 
a precarious labor market characterized by job insecurity, unfair and unequal wage distribution, uh, disproportionate increase of profits and non-unionism, then the current progress of digitalization complements and consolidates neoliberalism. Um, as robots set higher standards in terms of efficiency, labor productivity and agility, human labor is bound to be compared with these standards, leading to downwards pressure on wages and more stressful work. As such, automation brings about perhaps unexpected negative consequences. We should expect the coronavirus crisis to further advance uh, these processes. Uh, automated jobs tend to be of low pay and automation will increase anxiety among low-skilled workers. Employers may benefit from automation, but for workers, the negative consequences of, uh, outweigh the benefits. Um, increased digitalization leads to increased precarity, but also prompting further contestation. We have started to see grassroots social movements mobilizing against surveillance, deteriorating working conditions, low wages and unstructured works. Authoritarian neoliberalism in the digital era is therefore in a cycle of exploitation, anger, the emergence of citizens with more sophisticated demands and expectations and grassroots solidarity uh, initiatives. This is met by state-led or capital-led repression, which form part of the uh, attempt to ensure the societal competition and control that forms a prerequisite for the reproduction of capitalist uh, social relations. To conclude, coronavirus crisis is not likely to end the neoliberal neoliberalism and an ongoing process of digitalization is likely to consolidate authoritarian neoliberalism and that uh, creates further uh, contestation. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Saori, for this wonderful presentation. Before we move on, I, I would be really curious to hear from you if, so to what extent this and how this debate is unfolding in Japan specifically, I mean, given that that, that is also your expertise, I mean, has oh. is there such a public debate at all about the impact of, uh, of COVID in different ways on, on neoliberalism? Could you say just a couple of words about that? Um. Not quite sure whether that actual that direct debates are happening there, but that, that uh, in terms of a digitalization, there is, uh, of course, like like some other advanced economies, uh, there's a discussion about the coronavirus is leading to further kind of progress of uh, the integration of automation or robotization, and the governments are setting up more policies uh, to to kind of facilitate this progress as well. So th in that sense, there is this kind of um, the discussion in terms of uh, digitalization, but there's, there, I didn't find anything like specific direct correlation between the neoliberalism and digitalization per se, I, I, I don't think. Um, however, that, you know, institutional context also play a quite big role here. That like neoliberalism has been integrated in a different way in different country, in different uh, institutional context, that digitalization also uh, will be uh, integrated in a different different manner, in, depending on that kind of um, social social economic institutions, uh, their institutional kind of coordination as well. Because in the case of Japan, the aging society, uh, in general, much lower labor productivity in comparison to other advanced economies. This kind of technological development or integration kind of can be sold quite well to public in a, in a sense, and then that hides this kind of um, potential power relations, you know, the uneven power relations that if uh, the technology itself may, technology it themselves may not be, it may not directly create exploitation, but the, when they, they are it, <laughs> um, adopted or integrated by capital or by employers, then, you know, then, then, then they become potentially harmful. But, the, but that also that discourse that how they were sold in the international context and in the case of Japan, it's often tend to get maybe better kind of impression than some other countries poss possibly. Um, so that's just some short kind of remarks on the, the point you raised. <laughs> 
Thank you for those, uh, Saori. Let us now turn to Alfredo Saatfilio. Uh, Alfredo, the floor is, is yours. Thank you, Olaf. So to, to the question, does COVID-19 mean the end of neoliberalism? My answer is unambiguously no, uh, with the proviso that we are seeing changes in neoliberalism uh, itself. So I'm going to suggest that the pandemic has not destroyed the neoliberal system of accumulation, but this will of course depend on the definitions that we use. My view on neoliberalism is that this is the current phase. It is the current configuration of uh, global capitalism in our historical uh, period. And what the pandemic did uh, was to intensify features of neoliberalism that already uh, existed. Uh, and I think it highlighted very important limitations of neoliberalism that are um, likely to uh, um, lead to an accelerated drift into fascism, but we can also see movements of resistance emerging and the uh, outcome, of course, is open. So we start from uh, the point that we live today and we have lived for the past four decades or so in the age of neoliberalism. And the most important feature of neoliberalism is financialization. Financialization meaning the subordination of economic reproduction and social reproduction uh, to the accumulation of what Karl Marx called uh, interest-bearing capital, that's finance. Uh, and the core of this process of financialization is the transfer of control over the allocation of resources from Keynesian states or from developmental states onto a globally integrated financial system. And this is what has allowed finance to control the main sources of capital and to control the main levers of economic policy uh, in most countries. The next significant feature of globalization, sorry, of um, neoliberalism is the transnationalization of production and finance, which is what is commonly called globalization. And this is about the international integration of uh, individual circuits of accumulation at the level of firms. It's about the liberalization to support that, the liberalization of trade, of domestic finance, and of international capital flows. Next significant feature of neoliberalism is about the state. Neoliberalism, despite rhetoric, it's not about the withdrawal of the state, it's not about the rollback of the state. Um, neoliberalism is about building a neoliberal state that imposes and that legitimizes neoliberalism. It's about creating a state that transfers to finance control over the sources of capital, a state that uh, imposes a, a, a new legal framework that puts together a new industrial structure, a new financial structure, a state that privatizes a public asset, a state that represses the opposition to neoliberalism. And what we have seen in the past four decades is states and neoliberalism itself transforming economies, transforming societies, transforming public policies, and creating unprecedentedly favorable conditions for accumulation. Think about that. The West won the Cold War. Trade, finance, and capital movements have been liberalized. Competing states have provided unparalleled support to accumulation. All the traditional sources of resistance uh, have declined. Nationalist uh, movements and governments, trade unions, peasant movements, left-wing political parties, and neoliberalism has achieved ideological hegemony. With that came a tremendous recovery of profit rates after the low uh, rates uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. But you give neoliberalism all those favorable conditions, you give it profitability, and what do you find? You find that GDP growth and investment rates have tended to decline, especially in the poor uh, advanced economies, um, and between about 2007 and 2020, the West suffered uh, the deepest and the longest economic uh, crisis on record, the weakest and the most regressive economic recovery on record as well. And this is what I call the economic paradox of neoliberalism. You give it extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation, and neoliberalism show a shows a complete inability to capitalize on them. And that's the economy. Now move to politics. So 
by the 1990s, neoliberalism had become established around the world. Um, in most countries, not all, of course, it had also become associated with a typical democratic political form. But those neoliberal democracies were circumscribed. And in particular, they all had an institutional apparatus that was designed to lock in neoliberalism, that was designed to insulate economic policy from any form of interference by the majority of the population. And this setup disabled to a large extent the policy making capacity of the neoliberal state and it reduced enormously the policy space available even to democratic states and in doing this reduced the, the, the space available for legitimate opposition. So there was no alternative in the economic domain, so there was no need to debate the economy and the political space was then occupied by other things since you couldn't talk about the economy. It was occupied by culture, it was occupied by religion, it was occupied by nationalism, it was occupied by racism. So what I'm suggesting to you is that in contemporary neoliberalism, the collectivity of the working class has been by and large demolished, class politics has been defeated, and the social groups that we might call the economic losers under neoliberalism, they have been driven to frame their disappointments, their resentments, their fears, their hopes through the prism of an individualist ideological hegemony of neoliberalism, an individualist and commonsensical ethical conflict between insiders and outsiders, and through the lens of undue privilege given by the state to the undeserving poor, to minorities, to foreigners, and to foreign countries. So, what I'm calling the political paradox of neoliberalism is that the institutionalization of neoliberal democracy undermined the foundations of democracy itself. The structures of representation became unresponsive and public policy became increasingly indifferent to the majority. And in those circumstances of uh, economic stagnation, permanent fiscal austerity, particularly after the global financial crisis, this led to a crisis of democracy. The third paradox that I'll mention today is a paradox of authoritarianism. So you have an economic crisis, you have a political crisis in neoliberalism, the outcome was the personalization of politics and the emergence of what I call spectacular authoritarian right-wing political leaders, which became obvious with the election of uh, Narendra Modi as Prime Minister of India in 2014, the Brexit vote in the UK, the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the election of Jair Bolsonaro as President of Brazil in 2018. It, similar things happened in many other countries. The problem is that those leaders tend to follow neoliberal policies that undermine their own basis of support and their policies have the consequence of opening spaces for new forms of fascism to emerge. So what I'm suggesting is that we are facing a systemic political crisis in neoliberalism on top of the economic crisis uh, and the rise of those authoritarian uh, leaders is a symptom of the decomposition of neoliberal democracy, is the outcome of the crises of those restructured neoliberal economies, restructured political system, uh, restructured institutions of representation of the neoliberalism. This is also evidence of the hijacking of mass discontent by the far right. And the pandemic then hits in this context of economic crisis and political crisis. And what we found immediately was that the most uncompromisingly neoliberal economies could not mount a coherent response to the pandemic. Even though they could look at the examples of success that they could have followed, they could have followed China or Kerala State in India or New Zealand or Senegal or Singapore or Taiwan or South Korea. There's a whole range of examples of success that were not followed. And instead, those neoliberal authoritarian governments were tempted by policies of what we came to call herd immunity, whatever the cost in lives. In doing this, what they ended up doing was to allow the pandemic to progress, to perpetuate it, and to make the coronavirus effectively impossible to eliminate. And this was one of the most dramatic policy failures 
in recent decades. So the implication is that the crisis of public health and the crisis of the economy, they were uh, the outcome of policy choices. They were the outcome of the dismantling of state capacities under neoliberalism. They were the outcome of failures of implementation and they were the outcome of a shocking misunderstanding of the nature of the uh, health crisis. So I want to suggest that today, neoliberalism sustains itself primarily by coercion. This is not just about overt repression, it's also about fiscal austerity backed up by punishing measures against the poor, the underprivileged and the neglected. It's about the escalation of repression against dissent, including through electronic uh, monitoring. Let me conclude. The degeneration of neoliberalism and the degeneration of democracy they have to be confronted, they have to be confronted by broad alliances and by the integration of economic demands and political demands into a positive program for the expansion of political democracy and economic democracy. So in this sense, the pandemic is an indictment of neoliberalism itself, but it is also a rehearsal for the much bigger challenge of climate change. And the pandemic uh, shows that the impasses in the neoliberal economy, neoliberal politics, neoliberal health, they cannot be addressed through uh, a renewal of neoliberalism. They cannot be addressed through commitments to the so-called free market or through a reversal to fiscal uh, austerity. Even the attempt to do any of this will undermine what remains of democracy. So the pandemic can open spaces for progressive forms of political activity, with and around mobilizations for equality, for collectivity, and for economic and political democracy. And in my view, this is what we should uh, focus on uh, at this point uh, in time. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Alfredo. Um, I have, by the way, I have a, a bit of a connection issue at the moment, so it might be that I'm uh, uh, that you don't hear me well. Um, um, just, I mean, it is a very um, almost dystopian picture that you're painting here. Um, are there no glimmers of hope anywhere to be seen? Uh, for instance, this agreement of uh, the majority of countries in the world on this. A global minimum corporate tax. Um, do you see any glimmers of hope anywhere? Just very briefly. Well, yes, certainly. Um, what has happened in the United States is a significant political change within neoliberalism. The Bernie Sanders campaign was uh, very positive. The Corbyn movement in the UK. There are any there's any number of uh, progressive uh, coalitions, alliances, and movements emerging uh, around the world. The challenge is to strengthen them uh, as rapidly as is necessary at, at this point in time. But I am more optimistic now than I have been for many years. Thank you. Let's turn now to our last panelist of this session, uh, Marion Fourcade. Um, Marion, the floor is, is yours. All right, hello everyone. Um, so um, parts of this presentation, I just want to say, uh, uh, are inspired by pieces that I'm currently writing with uh, Henry Farrell and also another one with uh, Kieran Healy. Um, so you know, just to go back a little bit to the question of the, you know, what do we mean by neoliberalism? And, and Queen was way more specific than I. Uh, I'm going to be here. I just want to focus on sort of two, uh, two sort of traditions so that I can build on that. Um, we have a first meaning um, as a sort of neoliberalism as a policy paradigm, right, where uh, we mean essentially a set of, of, of policies, uh, welfare retrenchment, labor market flexibility, corporate self-regulation, tax cut, free trade, capital mobility, privatization, and of course, financialization. Of course, yeah, financialization is sort of the apotheosis of this, this process where 
uh, with the rule of shareholder value, where the purpose of the firm is not to make profit, but really to pump up the share price so as to attract investors. And so, you know, finance is in the driver's seat. And then we have a second meaning, which really stems from um, essentially originally the work of, of Michel Foucault. Um, and, uh, you know, and particularly Foucault's analysis of the significance of, of uh, Gary Becker, where, uh, you know, what, what is important is that people must learn to become entrepreneurs of themselves. That is, it's a process of essentially individuation and uh, making uh, the individual more and more competitive, more and more retrainable and so on. And of course, it's, it's, this happens to individuals and this happens also to ideas in the work of, for instance, Wendy Brown, you know, democracy um, is essentially the organized competition of ideas in the marketplace. Now, according to, you know, this meaning one, if you will, we've seen an important reversal during the pandemic, you know, central and actually it started before it started with the 2008 crisis, you know, central banks started printing money, you know, in enormous amounts so that the banks could continue to lend. Uh, so that the firms could continue to sort of, you know, uh, buy back their stock, essentially, that's what's happened. Um, we've had also massive income supports and corporate bailouts that, uh, you know, were rolled out during the pandemic and were financed essentially by debt with very few uh, worries about inflation. And then, you know, really, to, to me, the, the big change of the last, um, you know, 20 years also is that digital corporations have really come to be at the center of the process of value extraction. And actually there's an editorial by Yanis Varoufakis this morning in Project Syndicate that sort of, you know, um, makes that exact point um, where he says, you know, for the first time in history, almost everyone produces for free the capital stock of large corporations. And that suggests to him that we are moving fast and uh, beyond capitalism toward a new regime that Cedric Durand and others have called techno feudalism. But what I'd like to address is actually this second meaning of neoliberalism, the meaning of neoliberalism as a political rationality. You know, has it evolved or might it evolve further uh, in the wake of the pandemic? Now, from my point of view, perhaps the most significant change associated with the pandemic is actually the acceleration of virtualization in every domain, you know, what uh, uh, Sauri was, was talking about. So from schools to offices, to shops, to hospitals, everything and everyone has had to go uh, digital. And in fact, the pandemic uh, made the social opposition to digital mediation, you know, more or less irrelevant. I mean, teachers who were opposed to it, you know, basically had to go, you know, how to go um, uh, digital. So my presentations really focus on that, you know, how, uh, how digital capitalism might interact with the logic of uh, neoliberal po political rationality, you know, does it supercharge it, does it undermine it? So just to go back to Wendy Brown's work uh, in her book, uh, Undoing the Demos, um, she points out um, that um, the economization of democracy is one of the fundamental, trans tr fundamental transformations brought about by the advance of ne neoliberalism. And her logic goes something like this. You know, large corporation will see people deploy their power over the political fields and over all representative so social institutions, particularly the court system. And then we, we have court decisions in the US, the Supreme Court decisions that have effectively transformed democracy into a marketplace. But of course, it's a highly unequal one where those with economic power are able to translate that power into political influence, more or less uh, without limits. Um, but I think, let me, but I think that what we are seeing today is actually more subtle and more potentially corrosive. It is not only that citizens are being treated as consumers of packaged political messages, but that they have been made to think that all knowledge is nothing but interest. And I want to foreground again the role of large digital firms and techno-capitalism in that process. Now, one of the things uh, that, you know, one of the darkest ironies of our age is that advertising supported algorithmic systems rank knowledge according to its relevance, but they have in effect succeeded in destroying any and all concept of a hierarchy of knowledge. Under the rule of the large digital monopolies, um, uh, the, sorry, uh, uh, under the rule of large digital monopolies, the knowledge um, this 
um, uh, um, distributed by the professions and by science have actually taken, has actually taken an epistemic beating. It's been displaced by the, what I have called elsewhere the coding elite. The coding elite claims, in fact, to act as the democratic mediators or translators of a knowledge that is distributed, um, that is infinite and that is, you know, essentially uh, dispersed in a digitally collected collection of, of minds and bodies and things. So in practice, what this means is that we have elevated the wisdom of the algorithm over a democratic debate to pass through the process of knowledge generation. And that has huge, of course, uh, consequences for, for democracy. Much of the political process today actually revolves around wrestling over the ability to control and direct digital crowds. Um, the, um, now, a second aspect is that the transformation of search engines uh, from general purpose technology to personal digital assistance also, you know, that, that offers another good illustration of this process of decaying knowledge hierarchy. The web was originally celebrated, you may remember that moment, as a great democratic infrastructure. The freedom to search it and to express oneself through it was seen as both equalizing and emancipatory. The large digital firms were happy to encourage this searching disposition, which because, you know, in part it yield, yielded them more data. And searching actually made people feel like good citizens who are doing their due diligence and forming an opinion for themselves. Now, of course, that, that belief that you were a good citizen when you were searching was predicated on the original fiction of search engines as instruments of collective wisdom and mediation. But of course, this is not at all how they work. You know, search, and here I'm thinking mo mostly about Google, search is tied to advertising and thus to knowing the user intimately. And so people may not realize that the priors they bring to the search process itself, which are embedded in, you know, the vocabulary they use, the questions they ask, and often their whole search history, all of that is likely to yield such outcomes that conform to their already well-structured ideological world. This is the work by Francesca Tripodi I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about here. So rather than an arbiter of truth, search learns how to be relevant to a particular user as they seek an answer to a question they have formulated in a particular way. So we have seen the dramatic way this plays out in the pandemic as the way people search for information in a moment of intense uncertainty is leading them toward very different uh, corners of the web. Now, the digital platforms that intermediate this knowledge uh, for profit fall back on a laissez-faire attitude partly because they are not yet liable for the content that they produce, partly because they are loath to tell the, prob the public what to trust, at least they say so, and partly because they benefit financially from selling and directing uh, attention. So, you know, the outcome of all of that is that, you know, we have sort of compromised the very notion of epistemic authority and shifted the way that, you know, uh, people shift their, you know, take their bearings in the world, to use Anna Arendt's phrase, towards a post-truth uh, regime. Um, and, you know, um, of course, under these material and cultural circumstances, uh, uh, sort of Habermas in common ground, mean, you know, may be not only hard to reach, but fundamentally illegitimate. Now, what about the self? So, digitization facilitates comparisons between people, as Sari mentioned, and also the globalization of the competition between people. Um, and, uh, you know, scholars of neoliberalism have suggested that a key demand of a neoliberal order is that people must increasingly manage their persona across, across a range of financial and non-financial domains. Um, and of course, with digitization, this process comes in easily digestible forms, measure quantities such as scores, grades, and ranks. You know, that's a process that Michel Fair has called rated agency. So you think your credit score, your Uber or blah, blah car rating, and now possibly, as Sari was mentioning, your productivity at work, your kids' attentiveness at school. This logic has now the potential to diffuse much further and much deeper as the virtualization associated with the pandemic is enabling a new wave of data uh, generation. Oops. Um, but, you know, the question, thanks, the question is what does self-optimization look like in the era of algorithmic management? The fact is, you know, how this work on the self must be carried out is increasingly obscure. I think, you know, we have a tendency to assume that, well, 
you know, the algorithms is telling us exactly what to do. But in fact, you know, if you look at the way um, machine learning functions today, you know, the data generating practices that support computational sorting have become tremendously com uh, complicated. Um, you know, as you know, digital organizations, unlike analog ones, they sift through, you know, a very heterogeneous patchwork of sources, geolocation records, photographs, public records, workplaces, grocery store records, courthouse records, social service records, Fitbits, social networks, web browsers, and so much more. So, for instance, the domain of credit scoring, which I know a little bit about, um, is teeming with startups that promise to produce risk prediction with any kind of creatively sourced data. Now, Kieran Healy and I have used the term Uber Capital or Eigen Capital to capture this idea. This is our way of saying that the totality of a person's interactions with the digital economy, um, uh, to the extent that they are broken down into digestible bits, may be represented mathematically by a set of vectors or even by a coarse unitary number, as in, for instance, Chinese social credit. And the term Eigen is meant to, meant to capture that sort of high dimensionality uh, of, of the process. But one important specificity of Eigen Capital is its opacity. New computing techniques have the ability to discover pattern, you know, and optimize with virtually no pre-established conception about data structure. What the algorithm sees in the end, and especially how it sees, how it scores, how it ranks, how it predicts, that may be completely impossible to fathom. So what are we to do? What are people to do, you know? Um, you know, they, they are very poorly equipped to game, um, you know, the actuarial systems that, that rule their lives. So the only thing that may be left for them in the end is their willingness to cultivate, you know, this m m digitally mediated self um, that, but, and, and to be nudged in one direction or another by a machine that strives to know them better than they know themselves. So in many ways, the, the road to what I call, you know, the road to selfdom. Um, may actually lie there. So I'll just finish um, my, you know, I, just, I guess it's a rejoinder to, to Sari's uh, uh, talk. You know, as William Davis has, has observed, there's an inherent tension at the heart of neoliberalism between the celebration of competition as inherently fair and meritocratic um, and the perverse fascination with winner-take-all outcomes in practice. Uh, now, in a world where large monopolistic firms or the state control the production, distribution and use of information, democracy and the market may have already lost their edge as the most efficient forms of governance in the imagination of neoliberals. And of course, the signs are all around us, you know, between democratic backsliding um, and the rise of a, of a, of, of a sort of private uh, leviathan uh, in large uh, digital firms or you know, in China, where the one-party state has, you know, sort of supercharged its, its despotic rule through a combination of artificial intelligence and uh, extensive citizen monitoring. And so some people are sort of saying, well, we're moving toward a sort of neoliberal neostatism. Uh, I don't know what the correct word is, um, you know, whether it's techno-feudalism or neoliberal neostatism. Um, but I think it's, a, you know, it is a description of our current political economic di dilemma. So the real question in my mind is, you know, how do we go? Where do we go from there? And I'll just leave you at that. Thank you. It's tempting, of course, to hear your thoughts about, about that question that you end with, Marion, where, where do we uh, where do we go from here? But let's um, uh, invite the other panelists to respond to each other's talks. I saw uh, Quinn uh, asking in the chat already the question about the metaphor or the title of your talk of a road to Selden. Quinn, do you want to uh, to pick that up and, and uh, ask about the question? So how, uh, to what extent the this road to the self uh, was it that a road that was taken much earlier already? Um, yeah, sure. I guess I could just address it to both Marion and Sauri because there was kind of a similar tendency with both of their comments, which I, of course, thought were great and learned a lot from. Um, but I'm wondering if we're using this kind of Zuboffian framing, then um, what's the implication for the kind of COVID rupture? Uh, Sauri, you suggested what I thought I was hearing was that it simply intensified things that were already underway. And, and uh, Mariana, you didn't 
address it really directly, but I assume that you would say the same thing, question mark, like, do we see no countervailing tendencies with at least rhetorically the Biden administration saying that they're targeting big tech, at least trying to roll out things like the breakup of Facebook, whether or not they'll be able to by the courts and so on, we are still waiting to hear. But I mean, the, the appointment of Lena Khan as head of the FTC, I would imagine would suggest at least some countervailing movements coming from the most powerful country in the world. Is that just an impression that you think will be quickly bulldozed over? Is the technology too powerful? I can answer that question. So, you know, yes, of course you are, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, that, you know, I, I just left you with the darkest possible image and, you know, and uh, we are seeing already countervailing trendices. We're also seeing, for instance, in Europe, uh, some action against the use of so-called high-risk algorithm in certain areas. So, you know, the uh, algorithms cannot sort of judge people's performance in, in, in specific areas. I mean, a lot of the time what you, you know, uh, people are sort of uh, uh, looking for sort of the better algorithm, the next, you know, the next generation of it. So, you know, we don't know for, for how long. Um, but there is certainly, you know, there's lots of, there is a counter movement, fortunately. Uh, whether it will be successful, I guess it's it's for us to uh, uh, to analyze, and also it's for it's for us to put in you know to put it in motion. Um, but to to your question in the chat, you know the, about the road to selfdom, you know that you know implying contra Foucault somehow that the self was not active until recently. No, the point was you know that I was trying to make is that you know we have this sort of vision of a of a self that must be worked on and we are you know and of course all of these scores that we're receiving from you know from uh, all kinds of sources are, are uh, sort of uh, inciting us to constantly you know make ourselves fitter but at the same time we have no idea you know actually how the scores themselves are constructed so you know essentially we we work in the dark. So, you know, in some way, the road to selfdom was sort of this, you know, this trying to describe this process of, you know, um, trying to find the self somewhere, but, you know, it remaining constantly elusive and more or less, you know, embedded in this, you know, in these machines that sort of send us back an image of who we really are. Saori, would you like yeah. to address uh, Yeah, those so questions? any kind of, yeah, like um, techno technologies, this kind of current process is too powerful. The um, I think I think capitalism itself has been, you know, continuously reproduced itself. But at the same time, the, the I mean, I just only talk about the kind of working class or the, the social uh, labor movement type of uh, angle. Um, but at the same time, always there's a resistance, certain kind of a conflict, and then it's not like a kind of neoliberal project so have has been unchallenged. You know, it's always so. So like a current trend, one of the example could be like you know the gig workers, like uh, Uber drivers. You know, are they just only mere contractors? You know, then there's originally it was denied as a kind of workers' rights almost. Um, but I think it was kind of, there was some, I think there's uh, some names that I see that some people might be more qualified to answer that question, but I think there was some, um, you know, the, uh, the drivers, um, Uber drivers work probably should be categorized as, you know, the, the workers rather than just the contractors. So there's an ongoing kind of grassroots activism as well, I think. Um, in the case of Japan, that I, when I was interviewing the union uh, unionist, I was talking about are there any kind of direct resistance against these kind of technological developments and automation? And their answer was kind of simple. It's not like directly against te technology, but it's their job is to protect workers' rights. So whatever happens, they always raise voice against the, um, you know, the deteriorating working conditions and they, 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 any kind of exploitation. So I think um i well i am pessimistic in terms of the power of the capitalism that their authority and power over workers but at the same time i'm slightly optimistic a bit also i believe in these kind of grassroots activism as well so there are more and more kind of uh, demands or expectation that used to be maybe just on the union trade unions might have been going against those kind of 
exploitation, but there's a more kind of a different networks, different grassroots activism are also emerging as well, I think. So um, um, so it's not like a zero counter movement. I think we do see the different types of uh, power being exerted upon workers, but then, then we do see probably the emergence of maybe new types of um, kind of some kind of grassroots activism, I think. Yeah, so that's my um, uh, potential answer. Thank you. Um, be, before I already see one hand from the audience, um, before we turn to the audience, I would just uh, two hands from the audience, three. Um, I would just very briefly like to ask um, uh, both Quinn and Alfredo, actually, in, in your writings so far on uh, the uh, on COVID and, and neoliberalism, um, you make a comparison between the current crisis and previous moments in which um, uh, neoliberalism has been declared dead, for instance, in uh, the crisis of the financial crisis of 2008. And I would just like to invite you to say a couple of sentences about how that, that comparison plays out for you. Maybe Alfredo first and then Quinn, and then we turn to the audience. Um, as Quinn mentioned uh, in his contribution, now liberalism uh, has been declared dead a number of times, but it will always depend on your definition of neoliberalism. Uh, if the definition is very concrete, very specific, then it will die multiple times, but it will require every time that you declare it dead, it will ask you, uh, what is it that succeeded it? What is it that you've got instead of it? And then what was neoliberalism uh, in the first place? Um, I prefer a definition that is more systemic, uh, that can encompass a whole range of variation of uh, experiences of neoliberalism in different countries uh, and over time. It has shown enormous plasticity and enormous capacity for adaptation. My way to look at it is through financialization. There'll be other ways that are just as legitimate. In this sense, no, it, not only it has not died, particularly not after the uh, crisis of 2007, it has strengthened itself. It has demonstrated its ideological hegemony, its hegemony over public policymaking, because back then, just as now under the pandemic, the first sector to be salvaged was finance. The first sector to be solved at any expense, unlimited, unlimited expense, that is always finance. So we have a reproduction of neoliberalism, we have intensification, and we have demonstrations of fragility itself. But dead, it is not, definitely not. Um, when, like, yeah, yeah. Sure. So yeah, I think you can think of the crisis of neoliberalism in 2020 as a compounded version of its two previous near-death experiences in 2008, 2016. 2008, I think we can think of primarily in terms of monetary policy. I think we could think what broke there, what changed, what changed was um, the sort of world-making power of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States became obvious to all. And the, the sort of inflation curse was, the first crack was, was found in the kind of inflation curse, right? That had haunted. America since the 1970s. So this new idea that, that cracked the austerity ideology was opened through monetary policy in 2008. The firefighting um, function of the central bank became kind of normalized through the quantitative easing programs that followed in the decade afterwards. 2016, I think, was about trade policy. And here, you know, Alfredo mentioned Bernie Sanders. I think what happened in 2016 is Sanders broke another taboo in American political life which was that you weren't allowed to politicize the effects of globalization. You weren't allowed to say that the disruption of people's working lives was somehow, uh, could have been otherwise, should other policies have been chosen. When he was marginalized in the democratic primary, um, the clever sort of uh, strategical genius of Steve Bannon went and sort of picked through the Sanders campaign and just bolted on to the Trump stump speech, the parts that were working. And Trump then ended up being the one who really politicized political economy at a global level um, in a way that it hadn't been since the mid 1990s. So that has now opened up the possibility for um, industrial policy. It has opened up the possibility for a vision of kind of reindustrialization of parts of the United States. Um, it has made no longer um, inevitable 
the entanglement of the United States and the Chinese economy through manufacturing outsourcing. It has opened up the space that through now the the COVID moment has driven through the idea of supply chain resilience, the stuff about geoeconomics that people are writing about that has now been rapidly normalized, right? The idea of starting a trade war with China was considered madness by all mainstream economists in 2016. It's now embraced as the new normal from Canada to Mexico City to Brussels to DC. So I think that's that those are the two, that's the kind of two step there. The monetary policy of 2008 and the trade policy of 2016 has allowed for, I think, if we want to see anything really changing in the base policy paradigm, it's around those two things. Those are the two conditions that make a new paradigm possible. Whether or not it will be substantively different from the one we call neoliberal is the open question. Thanks. Um, let's turn to the audience now. I would propose to take two questions in uh, uh, in a sequence, unless there are people whose questions are really adding up to the questions that are already being asked. And then uh, let me know and, and we can maybe address them uh, jointly. Uh, Daniel Kinderman, you were first. Thank you all very much. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, my question, uh, can any of the panelists speak to who are the leading people, actors, or organizations behind the reformulation or rethinking of progressive neoliberalism? We're, I'm sure that neoliberalism will, will not go down uh, without a fight if it is indeed going down. Who, But who are the people who are trying to rethink it, reformulate it, uh, rebrand it, um, make adjustments, obviously, as are necessary in the current conjuncture? Uh, here, I, I don't believe that any of you have, have explicitly addressed that point. So if you have any thoughts, I would appreciate them. Thanks. Great. So I would propose to have another question. Tim Bartley. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, for these uh, comments. I wanted to ask about a couple of topics that I thought would probably be on the agenda and I haven't heard so much about and just throw them out there and see what your thoughts are. So um, the WTO. Uh, seems to be increasingly irrelevant, uh, and that would appear to me to be an important part of the question of what's happening with neoliberalism. Um, industrial policy, I think, came up just, just recently in Quinn's comments, but particularly the question of green industrial policy also seems really relevant uh, in understanding the, uh, the way in which states and global markets will be connected uh, in the coming years. And finally, you know, in response to Mar Marianne's uh, points about expertise and knowledge, it seems like what COVID had do has done is actually reassert expertise, but in a very a highly polarized kind of context in which uh, expertise is believed strongly and mobilized around by some part people on some parts of the political spectrum and resisted strongly on the other end. So uh, I just wanted to throw those out there and see if that provokes any other thoughts. Thanks. I'm sure it does. Um, who can I give the floor about this? And um, uh, please keep your answers also short for the panelists. Um, it, we have a little bit more than 10 minutes left, and it would be great to at least be able to uh, ask the other two questions as well, and maybe some more. I mean, I could just address that question very quickly. I think from to Daniel's question, I just put some, a link in the chat there, but I think that the, the Hewlett Foundation's Beyond Neoliberalism Initiative was extremely successful. I've heard recently that something like 26 of the 32 people that they gave money to are now in the Biden administration. Um, so if you are interested in the, the creation of a post neoliberal agenda, look at who they've funded. I mean, it's it's people from the Roosevelt Institute, Center for American Progress, Center for Equitable Growth. Um, look at Jared Bernstein and Heather Boucher. They have both have books. Jennifer Harris, who had headed the Beyond Neoliberalism Initiative, is now both on the National Security Council and the National Economic Council, um, representing labor questions. So these people all have op-eds. They all have books. They all have reports. Um, I would suggest that if you're interested in that, you, the intellectual framework, then check that out. Thanks, Mr. Quinn. Are they neoliberals? No. Who said they were? No. You're muted. Who of the, who of the other? Right. Let's, for the sake of yeah. time, I would like to uh, 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 also give the other panelists a chance and also the issues that Tim Bartley just brought up. 
I'll just uh, say a few things. One uh, is, you know, not so much about who is articulating that sort of progressive uh, neoliberal uh, agenda, um, but there's a very nice, somewhat old actually, piece uh, by Jim Ferguson called The Uses of Neoliberalism, uh, which is sort of looking exactly at that issue and is uh, sort of uh, laying out a sort of a, a, a agenda. Uh, for how to how to study it and how to think about it, and I think it's a beauty. It's an absolutely beautiful piece. Um, to Tim, uh, to Tim's uh, question, I mean, yes, you're probably right in in general about uh, sort of the you know we we had an enormous need, of course, for for expertise during um, during COVID and that you know. But again, I mean, we've had you know this enormous. Uh, uh, polarization um, and you know we're not out of the woods at all yet uh, you know the significant po uh, segment of the population doesn't want to get a vaccine still you know um, doesn't believe it is uh, it is uh, you know COVID is as serious as, as it is um, uh, presented and so on what I was talking about more is about sort of the the um, the way in which digitization is sort of chipping away at all kinds of professional knowledges, whether you know this is law, it is medicine, uh, you know, all kinds of service occupations, uh, you know, are being sort of uh, threatened not simply to be automated away. I mean, as we said earlier, the, uh, and I, I think Sari presented that very well. You know, what's really going on is this enormous, you know, uh, threat of de-skilling. Right, that the human will become sort of an accessory to the algorithm, um, but not, you know, uh, not, you know, the, the primary, the primary part. And you see that in welfare offices, you see that in schools, you see that everywhere. And so that that was sort of a general point about expertise being threatened. And, you know, I'm not the only one sort of to say that you can, you know, you can look at sort of Gile Yell's book, for instance, on the crisis of expertise, you know, that makes a, sort of a point about sort of not, sim you know, the the. The, um, the, the political attack on expertise, but also, you know, very fundamentally, the way in which, um, uh, you know, the coding elite, you know, claims to know better than a large number of professions that have traditionally held, you know, uh, significant privileges in our society. And that's, to me, that's a very big shift and a very important, you know, a very important change. And of course, COVID has accelerated that transition in many you know, in many professions. For for the sake of time, I would like to uh, invite the other um, uh, audience members who have questions to to ask them, and then the panelists, you can see which ones you respond to. Um, David Jetz Schwartz. Yeah, uh, I just uh, uh, I applaud the panel. Uh, if you look back through uh, Quinn's book, The Globalists, uh, you see, the, the, there's a, it, 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 the neoliberalism seems to be sort of like a multi-headed hydra, that, uh, and and one of those heads is distinctly racist, um, uh, it, it, as uh, seen in the his uh, tracing of the Mount Pelerin society and their views, um, and it, so that it seems that uh, you know uh, Mr. Trump, who is uh, uh, backing off of free trade. Uh, that's backing off of a, a neoliberal tenant, but on the other hand, he's, uh, as far as I could see, uh, distinctly racist, and also he's uh, cutting taxes. Seems to me that cutting taxes, especially on the wealthy, is a neoliberal priority. Uh, and I'm asking um, uh, Quinn or, or others if, if that, in, if, that, if I'm right about that. And and clearly, uh, I think that Alfredo's. Uh, position is, is overly pessimistic, or at least parts of his presentation overly pre over pessimistic, because uh, the, the entire, I mean, uh, Biden and uh, Harris won the election and they have control over the, uh, uh, of the, of the Congress, the swing, and, and there's, you know, there, there's ammunition there for the next election. To, I mean, this question whether we may not, the Democrats may not widen their, uh, their, their hold over those Congresses, right? I certainly hope so. Um, uh, uh, thank you. To okay. you thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for those questions, uh, David. Um, Manazi, um, uh, go for it. 
Thank you so much. Um, my question is uh, to Professor Sanjpilio in particular. Um, I really appreciated your talk and I've really found your work to be immensely useful and I've learned a lot from it. And especially in particular what you touched upon today, which is um, primarily that you think of neoliberalism as financialization um, and particularly draw on the concept of interest-bearing capital and the expansion of interest-bearing capital over the state uh, to think about how neoliberalism it not, has not ended, but has reproduced itself continually. So I was just wondering, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts and I'm curious to know what you think about some more recent developments over the last decade or so, particularly China's Belt and Road Initiative um, and the kinds of South-South development finance that these kinds of initiatives are promoting. So for example, if we think of the rise of sovereign wealth funds, in the global south, the rise of national development banks, um, development banks in the global south, or state-owned enterprises um, as instances where arguably the state is exerting some sort of control over resource allocation or the state is um, able to discipline capital in certain ways, um, albeit limited ways. I was just wondering how you conceptualize that um, in terms of neoliberalism and financialization in particular, and also uh, more generally, how you think about the moment of the pink tide and what that means for whether, neoliber whether we're transitioning away from neoliberalism or very much still within. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Manasi. We have only three minutes left, so I am afraid that the answers of the panelists will have to be very, very short. Um, who would like to give it a shot? Maybe Alfredo, because the last question was uh, directed to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is very difficult to summarize this within one minute. Um, the process of financialization that we see in recent times, it's, it, uh, it is embedded within, in my view, the industrial policies that are being implemented under neoliberal administrations. Uh, recently. So what, were, what we see in, it, in the advanced economies and in the developing countries of the global south is not a reversal to previous forms of policy intervention under Keynesianism or under developmentalism. It's a new type of industrial policy, a new type of state-driven, uh, state-led uh, economic policy that is itself financialized. So the large investments in infrastructure, for example, that we see since the global financial crisis and accelerating more recently, these are not reversals to the 1960s or 70s. These are new types of policy, of industrial policy intervention uh, that we have uh, today. I'll stop now, but I'm happy to continue this conversation via email if anyone is interested. That's a very generous offer. Um, who would like to probably have the a final word as the panelists, at least. And don't be modest. Can I just add the one thing that because the people talked about race issue, I think a neoliberal uh, project, um, I think our Fraser wrote somewhere like it, it is a class project and then it is so that that also means that very related to the race issues as well. And then as a person I st have to study a little bit of this digitalization automation. And uh, there's this kind of bias or uh, normally wa uh, works against low skilled jobs, uh, low skilled workers, low paid workers. And then that again connect, connects to that race issue there as well. So that's one of my short kind of, you know, comments on the, the race issue there. Thanks for, for that. And so it is 7.30 now, or at least it is 7.30 in Amsterdam where I am. I want to thank the audience for your attention and for the great questions. Uh, I would very, very much like to thank the panelists for this wonderful session. Given the topic, I think it has been inevitable that it has been going in quite a few directions and to really explore those directions for would have taken uh, much more, more time than we had, which is unfortunate, but at the same time, I thought it was a very and an inspiring session.
So thank you all for this. The chat is full of great suggestions to continue reading and there will be other opportunities in this IC conference to continue exactly these discussions. So thank you again, panelists. It was a great, great pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>